Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, is there really always a reason behind bad behaviour? And I'm in conversation with Susie Heyman. Yes, my name is Susie Heyman. I'm an agony aunt, a relationship counsellor. Um, I'm the author of 31 books. Um, I write about agony auntie-ish stuff, um, step families, teenagers, having a happy family, all those sorts of things. Um, I'm a stepmom. I have a son. I'm not his mother, but he is my son. And I have a granddaughter. When they were pregnant, they announced it by saying, I'm not going to be a step granny. I'm going to be a granny. Yay. <laughs> I've got a lovely husband. Um, I've got a cat. I live in the Lake District. Um, and I broadcast and I talk about families and relationships and young people and all that sort of thing. I'm the um, trustee of uh, a national charity called Family Lives, which is a sort of family you know, general. Um, and I'm also, I was, I'm retired now, trustee of the charity um, Become, which is for kids in care. So I have a particular interest in kids in care. And I'm a patron of a local charity called um, uh, Unique Kids, which is helping um, kids with autism. Wow. Do and you I, ever I, sleep? John, John Stapleton once said, um, and uh, when he introduced me, and said, an all-round smart ass. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's, that's a lot of stuff that you're doing. So how, how did you come to become an agony aunt? Did you, you know, grow up thinking, that's what I'd like to become? <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, I worked for the Family Planning Association um, and then for Brook Advisory Centres, and I was the information officer, press officer, mm. um, doing a lot of writing, I was sort of aiming towards journalism in a way, but I got very caught up in the whole thing about sexual health, young people, families, things like that. And um, when I was working with Brook Advisory Centres, we had a fabulous, wonderful woman called Dr. Faye Hutchinson, who's a psychosexual doctor, delightful woman. And um, I was once approached by 19 magazine to suggest somebody to be their agony aunt, and I suggested Faye. And the thing about Faye, God bless her, was that she couldn't, um, she didn't know a deadline if it hit her in the face. I mean, she, <laughs> the only way I could get her to actually, you know, submit every month was to sit her down and do it with her, which meant I sort of gave her a bit of a training in journalism and he, she gave me a training in counselling and, um, and in agony aunting. And I really had a taste of it. And then sometime later, I had the same thing happen to me that um, a magazine called, goodness, that was so long ago, which one was it? But they went to, um, to the FPA and said, can you suggest someone? And they suggested me. So I began, uh, that was a monthly magazine. And then I was headhunted by Woman's Own and then moved to Woman. Wow. And are there kind of particular issues that people come to you with as an agony aunt over the years that are your kind of preferred niche, if you like? Are there particular areas that you feel you're especially able to help with or that you've enjoyed? I suppose I've got a particular um, expertise in step families that particularly interests me. Um, families generally because of family lives I suppose and and kids in care because of kids generally and families with where there is conflict because of um, become um, so I suppose there's sort of an expertise in in step families yeah. having done it a t-shirt know what it's all about in that sort of sense but you can't necessarily advise better just because you've experienced something um, and often the sort of help you're giving people is not to tell them what to do you might be unpicking their story. You might be reflecting it back to them because they may not really have heard themselves and quite understood, you know, what are the real issues. So it's a generalist, and that's why I did my relate training, because it's a generalist sort of a, 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 um, experience in counselling that's the important thing to help people work out their problems. Because you're not telling them what to do. You can never tell somebody what to do. You help them arrive at a problem, a, a resolution to a problem that can work for them. And so really what you're trying to do is to get them to understand as well as, you know, you understand what is going on and what's really there and then work out the solution that will work for them. I see. And the, the question that, you know, we, we came to for today's episode was about whether there's always a reason behind um, bad behaviour. And I suppose this feels like a, a, a moment to sort of segue in there because it looks like you're, you're looking for, for, for reasons behind things and helping people to actually understand um, oh. the, the problem. Yeah, always. Because the three stages of counselling are um, exploring understanding and taking action and so in exploring what you're looking at is not just the, pre the presenting problem you're coming to me and saying this is my issue and you explore that but you also explore behind because you have to know what's underneath that makes that particularly difficult i'll give you an, um, uh, one of my sort of classic explanation one of my classic um uh illustrations of this was i helped a family who came to me with um step family issues um a man with his children woman with her child got together 
And the problem was that they presented it, the one child, his daughter was the problem. His sons were okay, her son was okay, everything was fine except this one child was the problem and making things difficult because all of a sudden she'd be kicking off at school and being sort of cheeky and not doing her work and things like that. Um, she was the issue. Solve her, cure her, <laughs> and we'll all be okay. And the question I asked, and this is the question I think you should always ask, which is what happened? If somebody starts doing something, behaving in particular ways that are difficult, what happened? And then what happened may not be immediate. It may not be last week. It can be five years ago, but something's triggered that off. And I discovered with this girl, okay, her mother had died. Well, yes, they knew that, but that was years ago. Surely we got over that. Um, recently, his father had died. His father. Hang on, that's her grandfather. Her grandfather has died. Actually, a bit before that, her grandmother, the maternal grandmother, had also died. Well, that's the last link she had to her mother's family. Oh, and recently, her best friend's mother had died. Oh, oh wow. And the dog got locked and knocked over and killed a, a couple of days before she started. <laughs> and, you know, when you actually looked at what happened, there was a list of things that this child had experienced loss over. A list of things that were really upsetting her and worrying her and triggering her off. And it was as if nobody had actually looked at the, what was happening and seeing how much this was affecting her. That in a sense that they're losing the grandfather and the grandmother was triggering off her feelings about her mother being lost and, and even the dog. <laughs> Everything was culminating in this child feeling upset and un And she couldn't necessarily tell me. She couldn't necessarily herself put her finger on what happened. It was that she knew she was restless, unhappy, and nobody was paying her attention, and so she was kicking one. So that when you unpacked all that and started looking at it, actually the answer to the question was, why wouldn't she be behaving badly? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's often what happens. If you actually look at the what's happened, you start realizing why people are behaving in particular ways. They're kicking off about something recent in the past, recent that has triggered the past, all those sorts of things that they may be angry about, they may have experienced loss about, they may be, it may have, you know, affected their self-confidence, their feeling of where they were in the, in, in, in the world, where they were in a family. I mean, step families, one of the things about step families, of course, is one of the things that upsets you is that it upsets your place in the family. You might have been the youngest child and all of a sudden you're no longer the youngest child. You may be the oldest child and all of a sudden you're not. You're a middle child and all of a sudden there's more middles around you. Your place in that family has been upset. Your place in the world has been upset. On top of all the things that have led you to being in that particular situation. So whatever, step families or anything, the question everybody needs to ask when something happens, when something a child or an adult is feeling unhappy is. And do you think there's always something? Do you always find something when you begin to pick it apart? I think so. Um, I mean, I was thinking this, I, I made a somewhat sarky comment on Twitter you might have seen about, um, you know, that if I had the time machine and could go back and change things, the usual one is, oh, well, you know, go back and assassinate Hitler. Well, actually, no, because somebody would have stepped in his place because that was the whole point that was happening in the political situation at the time. Trump, I think he's pretty unique. Let's get rid of him. That would be lovely. Um, <laughs> really, really triggered. Um, Anti-vaxxers have been around forever, but there's one particular man, and I will not mention his name, <laughs> um, who, in a sense, gave them the excuse of, well, there, there you are, a doctor said it. Remove him? Yeah, that might be a good idea. But somebody else remarked quite rightly, knowing me, yeah, but you might have changed them if you'd gone back and done something about their, their upbringing. And it's quite true. Mm. Look at somebody's upbringing, what their parents were like, what their grandparents were like, whether they had parents and grandparents. That affects them. I mean, even somebody who was psychopathic or sociopathic, something triggered it, whether it was a, a, you know, a physical illness, physical brain chemistry, or whether it was an event or a succession of events that actually has done this to them. And this is what counselling is often about. It's, it's unpacking, it's telling the story, and then starting to, you know, see, shaking that spider's web, all those things that have led that person to be where they're at the moment, and starting to understand. And so many times I've been with people where you go through this, and you'll get somebody saying, oh, oh, I never thought, I never realised, oh my God, when you say it, I get this uprush of emotion and I can now actually put my finger on what, in a sense, is underneath all this that is triggering off a lot of my feelings and a lot of my actions. And once you know, often, it rather melts away. Not always, but at least sometimes you can help people to take different decisions, make different choices when they understand what might have triggered off the behaviour that they are now showing. And how do you go about finding that out because that's something that scares a lot of people isn't it opening up these kinds of cans of worms when you're not quite sure what you might discover 
Exactly, exactly. And, and not just you, but the other people around you may actually find this very frightening because often um, it's almost as if they, you know, they don't want the blame to attach to them. So if you can say it's that person, then it's their fault and it's nothing to do with you. And sometimes when you start unpacking stories, people start thinking, well, maybe it's me. It's interesting, you know, when people come for counselling, sometimes the person who is very keen on coming to counselling may not be the one who actually wants to do most of the work in it. And in fact, what they want you to do is to say, oh, yes, you're right, it was the other person's fault. Mm. And then they look at me, I've come to counselling, I'm open to change, but in fact, they're not. So that counselling can often be a very, um, you know, it's a very tricky tight roping situation because you are trying to help people tell their story and start understanding their story and understanding where it fits in with everything else. Um, but often what you're dealing with is these different agendas. I don't want to be to blame, I want to blame them. I, I don't want to be involved. I want to, you know, I want to say that I'm doing the work, but I'm not. It's a lot of work. And so the answer is, okay, yes, it can often be very, very tricky and very difficult and sometimes exceedingly painful for the people involved. If they go through with it, the results can be transformational. Yeah. But it's hard work. Yeah. It's hard work for everybody. And I really admire people who come. I can, the particular family I can think of that I, I've kept in touch with that I did television series with. And uh, my goodness, did they grab it and run with it. And they really did want to know, they understand what was going on and want to make changes. Um, and when the, 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 two, the, the two adults concerned were doing this, the younger ones started to get into it too. Um, and what are we talking? God, 10 or 15 years on. My goodness, what a changed family that is. Um, because they did the work and understood that they had to do the work. I mean, you, you know, when counselling, you say it's sort of 50-50. It's 50% perhaps what you're bringing to it. The insights you may have, the understanding you may have, the ability to put your finger on what's going on here and explain it back. But it has to be 50% of the other person, the actual person whose problem it is. They have to put in 50% of the work. And if they don't do that, you are very unlikely to get anywhere. If they do, poof, as I said, transfer. Mm -hmm. And how does it work when you're supporting, um, you know, families where the, you know, the child is in, in care? So you said that's a particular interest of yours and it's, mm. it's a particular interest of mine as well. But potentially there you're in a situation where it's a lot harder to get the full picture or to get everyone on board. I mean, how does that work? It can be difficult. It's one of my, one of the things that I feel very strongly about and I don't think it happens enough, which is when, when kids are taken into care, I don't think enough help is given to the people whose children have been taken away from them for mm. whatever reasons. And this is where you often get a repeating situation because if you've got somebody who has a baby and the baby's taken into care, they'll probably get pregnant again mm. and, and again. And you have some people where this is a succession of pregnancies where the child is taken away because what they're desperately trying to do is they want somebody to love and to be loved by. They want to succeed, but they're not being given any help to do so. Mm. And I think we do invest enough attention and help into people who have had children taken away from them. A hard job because often if you're you know you've got to that stage where your children are having to be taken away from you you probably are absolutely layered in defensiveness and pain and anger and so it can be extremely hard to offer help because you can't change other people they have to change themselves they have to be you know invested in doing something about it but as I said I don't think as a society we do enough in helping people in that sort of situation we help the kids but you see, this is it. And, and, and I've got a couple of people, you probably know them as well on Twitter, who um, there's one particular man who's written some very, very good stuff about being in care. Mm. And so he's been tweeting recently about being so proud of the fact that he was in care, his mother was in care, his son did not go into care. He's broken that cycle. And my goodness, he deserves to, you know, to feel proud of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it is often a cycle, because that's what you've learned. You haven't learned how to love and look after or be loved and looked after. Um, you've learned in a sense to be disappointed and to, to be angry and be all sorts of things. And so that's why you get those cycles. If it's broken, isn't that wonderful? So yes, I would like to see a lot more invested in um, helping people who have got issues around parenting. Um, I don't think we put enough into it. What kind of help do you think that um, those people would really benefit from? What are the, you know, is there a sort of, I don't know, particular sort of skills or <laughs> understanding that you think, it, 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 I'm guessing there's not a one size fits all, but what do you think mm -hmm. would help? Mm -hmm. Well, I think parenting skills. Mm -hmm. I think understanding also what maybe you have lost out on and recognising that if you haven't had the training to be a parent from your own parent, then clearly it's very difficult to learn how to do it for yourself. 
One I thought was a very interesting thing, I know that um, I'm a triple P um, uh, accredited count, uh, parenting ex uh, expert, or whatever they call it. Um, this is the Positive Parenting Program from Australia. Um, and I know that, um, was it uh, around them, they did some work on um, what, was, what had better outcomes if you offered parenting skills training to people or if you offered relationship skills. But if you were having a you know, family come forward, they've got, they've got issues, they've got difficulties, there's conflict, there's all sorts of things going on. And what you do is you put them through a parenting course and what were the outcomes of that? Or you put them through a relationship course and what were the outcomes of that? And what they found was actually the parenting course did better. Okay. It's transferable skills. And because when you think of it, what is the best basis for being a parent is to be somebody in a loving relationship, knowing how that works, able to relate to your partner and therefore able to take those skills to relate and understand to your own children. And so I think, you know, maybe what we ought to do, I mean, if I was the empress of the world, <laughs> what I would do is make sure that what school, school started off on. I mean, yes, it's absolutely lovely to know the, you know, the date of the Spanish Armada and the boiling point of nitric acid, all those sorts of things. Fascinating bits of information that you might use in the future. Although, let's face it, you can now Google and you don't have to learn them in school. What we ought to be learning in school is how to relate and how to understand ourselves. And why do we do certain things and how to be friends and what is friendship? And what, what, you know, what are the ways where we can be confident about ourselves and be confident about other people and have respect for other people and ask them to have respect for us? All those things, that to me should be actually the basis of any education. It's now being bolted on. I mean, there's an extremely good parenting course, uh, uh, well, family courses going around in schools. Very good ones. And there's some exceedingly good parenting courses that you can imagine. I mean, family lives run them. Fabulous. And they do help but necessarily they're coming in late they're coming in bolted on to where there is a problem rather than starting right from the beginning and it seems to me if we all recognized being a, a partner being a person being a friend um being a and certainly being a parent these are not skills that you're innately born with no they are things that you learn and of course you learn them from the people around you and if you don't get a very good, you know, uh, as it were, uh, skills based in parenting from your own parents, how on earth are you going to be able to do it yourself unless you have some help and support and understanding what goes on? And do you think that that is worsened by the fact that in today's age, you know, the thing we might be comparing ourselves is to the stories that people present online rather than actual real life and communities? Yeah. I like to say in a sense, you know, what goes around comes around. It's all the same. I mean, the sort of problems that I've, I, I get, I've been getting in my agony page for the last 20 years, to a certain extent, can be very, very similar. People are more prepared to be explicit, maybe, than they used to be. And they've got more information now than they used to be. But on the whole, it's, it's, it's sort of the same. But, yeah, I think that um, there isn't enough talked about these sorts of issues. There really isn't. We don't do it enough. Mm. Yeah, I think, uh, see, one of the things I find challenging as a parent with the online thing in particular is that kind of everyone else's perfect lives thing, yes. you know, and you always feel like you're failing. <laughs> well, this is the point, is the airbrush, mm. and it's the fake news. And so that what you do tend to get online, of course, yes, is, you know, and what was that ghastly man some time ago who actually printed his daughter's, um, you know, school report on, mm. you know, aren't I a wonderful parent? Look at how well my child has done. I mean, let's not go there on, on, on the, did he ask her permission? But even if he did, did she understand what was going on? But it's the attitude of, you know, that the success of my parenting is shown in her marks, not necessarily. But it does set up a situation where everybody else feels jealous and they don't actually know what really is going on because airbrushing, airbrushing occurs. So the, you know, and you can tell I'm not airbrushed. I don't airbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that, that you do, so to a certain extent, compare yourself to the people who are presenting um, a picture which may not be entirely accurate. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's written. It's, um, it's, it's curated. Um, isn't it fascinating watching the backgrounds in people? <laughs> Mine's fairly, uh, <laughs> you know, there's not much in that. But if you watch a politician or, you know, a lot of people um, doing Zooms, it's a wonderful wall of books. Mm. I have to think, you know, is, is that actually a picture? Is that a skin <laughs> pulse? You are presenting an image of yourself that you want other people to understand. And that's one of the problems about, you know, how parenting works, that an awful lot of people are presenting a picture and it's not entirely fair. And it, particularly with celebrities. And if you look at the, you know, the, 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 as it were, the sad record of so many celebrities in 
um, how well their relationships proceed and how well their parenting proceeds. And even when they're probably limiting how much information you get, you can see behind it, it's not very good. Yeah. Because what they're looking at is, is the, the external show rather than actually what's going on underneath. And I think, you know, this is what we need to recognize. Parenting is difficult. It's hard. You have to learn how to do it. Actually, you do learn how to do it, whether you learn it from your parents or the people you see around them, or whether you'll be lucky enough to actually sit down and say, okay, you know, this may be a, you know, this may be a way of doing it. How can I do it better? Let's learn. It's one of the things I find myself telling schools often actually is about when they're engaging with parents and families about how much the schools have got to share that's of value because sometimes I think that there's this fear that it will seem condescending because parents are experts in their children but actually when you work in a school you've parented hundreds of children um, and often you've got really good practical ideas about how to get this right don't you? Absolutely and you're not necessarily an expert in your own child. You might have been an expert in your young child because your young child shares things with you. As soon as your child gets to certainly teenager, maybe even tweens, that shift happens. This is, this, is, this is the task of adolescence is to pull away, is to become your own person, is to actually look to your friends for who you compare yourself to and who you learn from than your parents. So when it was with your parents, you would tell your parents things and ask your parent questions. When it becomes your friends, you share things with them you tell them things you don't necessarily tell your parent and i'm afraid whenever i get a parent who says to me confidently oh my teenage daughter or son tells me everything i you know warning signs go off because if you think that <laughs> you're not listening and you're not realizing what's really going on because in a sense properly you shouldn't properly speaking your adolescence shouldn't be sharing with you. and in fact that's why the teachers probably do know more about your adolescent child than you do because they see the adolescent child without the, 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 the filter that you've put on with, the, in, in, with this fond idea that you know all about them, and also interacting with other people in a way that actually reveals a lot more than you know, what comes out maybe in the world. And parents will often feel like they've done something wrong if they're finding out, for example, that their child is self-harming and they've told the school before they've told a parent. What's your view on that? Yeah, you, no, no, no. As I said, I, I, you, I don't think you should expect your child, your teenager, to come to you first thing, really, because they're so intent on trying to be adults and to grow away from you and to do it themselves and stand on their own two feet. You probably are the last person they would, they would talk to. You haven't done anything wrong. What you may want to look at is what, again, it's the what's happened. What's going on in the family? What's going on in my child? That they've chosen this as a solution. That's one of the important things I think we need to recognize that when young people start doing something weird, um, self harming, uh, dabbling in drink and drugs and anything like that, um, arguing, whatever, to them, you, you see it as a problem. And so, what you might want to do is let's solve the problem of whatever it is they're doing. They see it as a solution. They're doing it because it's a solution to whatever it is that is bothering them. So, self harming, cutting. That's a solution. It makes me feel better when I do this. It releases something. Um, drinking, drugs, all of these things are from the child's point of view. And for anybody who is doing this sort of thing, it's part of your coping mechanism and your solution. And so therefore, what you ought to be looking at is not the thing itself. <laughs> my child is drinking too much. My, my, my child is dabbling in drugs. It's why might they be doing this? What may be going on in their life that this is their way of trying to cope with, solve, whatever, answer? This particular problem in them. Do you think that's true of a sort of wide range of behaviours that we're kind of looking beyond behaviour and asking the the kind of why and and then maybe looking how else might one manage? Absolutely, absolutely, because behaviour comes out of feelings, and you know you have the deep feelings, which is the need for love and attention and and and, and you know a, a feeling of self confidence, a feeling of self esteem. That's what's the underlying thing. And then on top of that, you then have the feelings of, you know, I, I, of need, of, 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 of um, anger, of pain, whatever, love, you know, those sorts of things. And then you get the behavior that comes out of that. And so if you look at the behavior, you have to dig down into the initial thing of, you know, why they're doing this and then right down into what's actually at the bottom of this. And, you know, to a certain extent, right at the bottom, it always is a wish for acceptance, a wish, a need for, um, you know, feeling good about yourself, all of those. But how have they come up into the next level of feelings? And then how do they actually emerge in the day? And how do you go about 
kind of defining I, I, it feels to me like maybe there's different roles that the different adults kind of play things so we talked about the difference between perhaps school and home for example and how do you know if an adult's worried about a child for whatever reason you know they're seeing some some behavior that's interesting that's different how do we work out what we should be doing and what our role is within that child's life sometimes asking the question what can i do and that's always in a sense where you begin with rather than saying you should be doing this or I don't like this, so I, you know, I disapprove of that. It's what can I do to help? It seems to me there's an issue carrying on, there's a problem going on here. Um, what can I do to help? Can we go to, you know, is there someone else you'd like to talk to? Um, and I mean, I think, I think it's having the courage to also realize you can't be all things to your child and therefore you do need to actually harness other people. Could be teachers, um, could be counselors, um, could be youth club. They could be, they could be an important adult. I mean, it's sometimes things like, um, the, the child I mentioned about what, you know, what had uh, gone on in their, their background, all these things, and why wouldn't that child be, be actually showing? Mm. I, I don't know if I mentioned the actual, the other thing was that it was um, her, her best friend's mother had died as well, wow. in all that litany of horrible things that had happened to her. But the point there was that the best friend's mother was very important to her because her own mother wasn't there. And I think that's the thing, that sometimes there's a, there's a chosen adult in your child's life. And it might be someone that you maybe not quite realise that they're there. But, and it may be a teacher, it may be a relative, it may be the next door neighbour, it may be a friend of a friend, parent of a friend, something like that. There may be that adult that you could, in a sense, say to, can you help? Not you tell me what my child has been telling you, not you tell your, my child what I want you to say, but just do they come to you and can I encourage them, encourage you to feel it's okay to actually help the child? But, you know, you also have to, to understand about sometimes confidentiality. So that you are saying maybe to your child is, yes, please talk to a teacher, talk to a counsellor, talk to you know, a chosen adult. Um, and I'm not going to ask them what you've said, because that's your thing. So it's about having a bit of trust and letting go a little bit almost. Very much so. <laughs> and that is when I talked about the task of teenagers is, is, the, is the pulling away. The task of adolescence is to pull away from your parents and become eventually an adult in your own right. And it, it goes in and out. So you want to sit on their lap and, you know, suck your thumb one day and be the big, you know, the adult the next day. Um, but basically that's what you're an apprentice adult working your way through that. But I think also that it's about um, your recognising you have a task, which is to let go, as you said, it's letting go. Um, and that's what adolescence with your child is all about, is them pulling away and you letting them go. And it takes an enormous amount of courage to actually say, I am no longer the central person in my child's life. What a loss. And, you know, if we're talking about losses, that's a loss that every parent needs to actually recognise and encompass. You are losing being the central person in your child's life. If you let them go, they'll come back. <laughs> if on, they'll struggle and, 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 you know, take the first sort of way out as soon as they can. It's about having that courage to say, I'm here for you. I will, whatever you want, I'm here. My love is unconditional. I may not like exactly what you're doing, but my love is unconditional. I'm here for you if you need me, but I'm not going to insist that you do it this way or that way. That's hard, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> God, I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky. I mean, again, you know, sort of walking the talk here. Um, I have this boy who is my son, although I'm not his mother and I adore him. But I can remember times when I could sort of sit back and say, well, okay, but that's his mom <laughs> and his dad that deal with that. I don't have to. Um, now with my granddaughter, she's my granddaughter, so maybe I sort of feel more part of that. But that's a bit, you know, that's that's slightly um, more of a, a of a distant relationship than with your own child. With your own child, your own child's successes and and um, triumphs and miseries are a reflection on you. Um, and so it's 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 very hard to actually lose control of that and to say, go and do your own thing, and I'm there for you, but I'm not going to steer you because I shouldn't. But my goodness, how many parents find that very, very hard? Yeah. I, I remember someone saying to me when um, we were going through a, a challenging time with one of my daughters that you're only ever as happy as your least happy child. Um, <laughs> and it was so true. <laughs> and it's hard, though, because you can't fix things for them, can you? You can try and create an environment in order for things to improve, but you can't fundamentally change how they feel. I think that's the point. It's the fix. You know, that when our children are young, we do feel that we're there to fix things for them. Um, you know, to solve the problems, to make it better, to kiss it better, um, to resolve any arguments, to smooth the path. When they get to be teenagers, that is actually the very wrong thing. The very worst thing you can do is to try and, and, and in a sense, curate their life yeah. because they want to do it for themselves. And if you, if you keep interfering, they're never going to learn. And they're always going to feel 
I'm not good enough if I can't do it for myself, if I can't make my own mistakes. Making mistakes is fine. Another thing we ought to do at schools, actually, is, is praise failure. I really do think we ought to be much more open about failure is good because it allows you to see what did I do wrong? How can I do it better? But we're so frightened of the idea of failing that we call people losers or failures if they, if, they, if they make a mistake. No, no, no. We ought to see it as a natural progression. And it's the same with young people. We need to let them fail and make mistakes. And we as parents need to fail and make mistakes and not think it's the end of the world. We can't be right all the time. We are there to be supportive of our teenage children, not, not the absolute guides and not certainly not in charge of them. So we should be kind of role modelling that mistake making. That's right. Oh, I think so. I think showing, you know, damn, I did that wrong. Right. How am I going to get it better next time? Um, you know, that's OK. Not hiding failure or making excuses or being in denial. I mean, good grief, America at the moment is taking such you know, a seminar in how not to say I lost. Yeah. And it's the most ghastly model that you're being given of, you know, it's like a, 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 a sort of little child. To toddlers are allowed to have toddler tantrums when they do something wrong because that's part of learning how to deal with it and to show your horror and displeasure that it didn't go your way. You have a toddler tantrum and then you get up and you try again. Um, and you can have an argument or you can have a sort of a display and slam doors and do all sorts of things as a teenager. But what we hope to do eventually as adults is when something goes wrong and doesn't go our way to say, oh, damn. <laughs> okay, try again. Do that and do it a different way. Um, but you know, models, you say, I think the model thing is, is so important. We should model to our young people how to have an argument and resolve it, how to, you know, look at things and do it differently. Um, you know, how not to do the definition of insanity, which is try the same thing again and again and again and be quite surprised if it results in the same thing again and again. Um, it, it's always trying it differently. Models are so important. How we do it, that's what we show our children. And loving them is an incredibly important you know, model. I mean, I'm so pleased in the last few years of the way that men have come into the family instead of being the, you know, the bread earners, the, the people outside there don't show weakness and failure and happiness and unhappiness they're now just with women as well um, being with toddlers and being hands-on and the, the, the you know the, the i think this the, this generation of the teenagers now are so much more fortunate than ones let's say 50 years ago who only had one person in their family who was showing that you could love and you could cry and you could do all those sort of emotional things men didn't do it only women did it now they're getting the example in so many families of men do it as well that is so much better for the men and for their children and for their partners. Absolutely. It's one of the things I'm, I'm constantly blown away by, actually, when I do kind of uh, youth engagement work is the emotional literacy of our teenagers right now. It's, it's phenomenal. I mean, I learn from them every time I work with them. Yes, exactly. Same here. Looking at my granddaughter, talking to her and about her friends. Absolutely brilliant. It is actually quite, you know, and I'm not sure you know where exactly that comes from because it's not it, I'm, I'm sure there are fantastic schools that do that sort of misuse you know but it's also what they see around them and it's the models that they are seeing far more um, in their families of you know of being able to show emotions and deal with emotions and talk about all sorts of things yeah absolutely is there anything that you have had to significantly change your mind on um, so obviously you've been agony aunting and advising for a while um you've yeah. written many books is there anything that you yeah that you do very differently now than you might have advised earlier um, i think it's probably begins through the training it's understanding you know bad people do do bad things that actually usually it's because bad things have happened to them so it's being much more understanding about people who behave badly and understanding why and understanding what's going on and seeing how people can be redeemed. I think that's the important thing. Um, one of the, um, the organizations under the umbrella of family lives for some time was, was, a, was one that helped um, uh, families who had a partner in jail. Mm. And one of the things we know is that um, with uh, men, in, particularly men, always but you know particularly men um if they are plugged into the family if the family are still keeping up a connection they are so much less likely to come out and go back to crime and they are so much less likely to have mental health issues if, they, if they're still in the family and they come out to their family it's so much better and yet we again we don't support that enough in this country we tend to have this feeling if any, anybody's committed a crime and goes to jail they need to be punished rather than they need to be changed helped, supported, and that one of those supportive things is looking after the family as well. The families themselves 
often are serving just as much as a, a sentence as the, the, the person who's actually in the jail, um, and usually less supported in a sense than the person who's in the jail. So it's, it's, it's seeing the importance of actually helping people who've done the wrong thing. And this is again back to um, families who've had children taken into care. Mm. Helping anybody, if all you're saying is, you know, they did a terrible thing, they were abusive to their child, get rid of them. But understand why they did that. What was the failure? Where was the failure? What, what, you know, what was going on there? And help them support them. Now that doesn't mean to say that you put all the attention on that person. I mean, this is the, the, the baby P scandal. It was because I think the social workers were so concerned with the mother <laughs> that they were actually missing out what was happening to the child. And so sometimes you have to be, as a social worker or a counsellor, very good at splitting your, you know, your, your attention, making sure that everybody in the picture is actually getting full attention. But it, it's about that therapy and that support going to everybody in the mix in order to have better outcomes. Absolutely. And one of the things that I'm working hard on at the moment with schools, mm -hmm. and it's still an, an earlier area for me in terms of understanding, but... Mm -hmm is thinking about sort of our trauma informed work and how so often those issues are hugely intergenerational and that if we're trying to support a, a child um, mm. through trauma informed practice actually often there are traumatized adults there who've never had this kindness and caring and love and support um, that the child's mm. receiving and unless they can receive it too often it's very hard to sustain Precisely, because in fact what you do then is send the child back maybe to the same situation mm. At an additional level, perhaps, of the adults feeling, why did they get all the attention and what about me? Which is actually quite justifiable. Yeah. Um, that it, it, if, if, you know, because things tend to come in families, because these sorts of things do, as you say, they are intergenerational. We need to actually extend that help, not just to the next level up, even to the next level above that as well. That there needs to be support for anybody involved in that sort of situation. And, and care and concern. I think this is the point. It's the care and concern of that's why there is a problem um not because i mean i have an absolute committed deep um belief that people do not behave badly because they want to be behaving badly or because they're bad people they behave badly often because bad things have happened to them and they react to it mm. and they react to it in ways that are not helpful to them or anybody around them because they don't have the insight because they haven't had the help in doing something about it and so you know if you've got horrible things happen look at why and, and put some, I mean, if you think about it, financially speaking, we, we would actually be saving so much money if we were putting a lot more money into therapy and help and support than we do at the moment. Because the end result, and you know, the, the, the end of the line, as it were, of people not being supported is crime and suicide and illness, mental illness, physical illness, all those sorts of things, which are far more expensive. Mm. It'd be far better to absolutely sink our billions into supporting and mm. helping people. Absolutely. And do you think that um, in terms of supporting those adults, like whose who's role should that be? Where does that sit? Because again, you know, I find myself doing this work with schools and there does come that question, well, where does their job end? You know, we expect them to do everything. And yes. yes. Well, in a sense, I mean, teachers, I, I started as a teacher myself. That's yeah. what my initial training was as a teacher. And this is one of the things that I was seeing was that you can't teach if people are traumatised. Mm. As someone who is coming from a home with issues, they're not receptive to learning. And so if you want to do your job, you cannot say my only job as a teacher is to teach, is to impart information. Because actually what you should be doing anyway is not imparting information, but imparting the ability to find out information for yourself, to inspire, to, to, you know, to give confidence to people, to guide them in, in learning, which is not in parroting what you've got to say to them. So you're starting off already with an idea of learning is not just sit there and I'll tell you things. It's a bit more than that. I think to a certain extent, therefore, we should recognise that we have to extend it sideways. People can't learn if they're in conflict situations, if they're in traumatic situations, if things are going wrong in their families. And they often can't learn for themselves, but they also you know, stop the people around them learning because these are the kids who kick off and are disruptive. So when you have a kid who is disruptive, it's happened. And, and where should we be putting that? And if it's not the teachers actually doing it, the teachers maybe should trigger it. And we should have teams of counsellors available to schools to do this sort of thing. If it became something that everybody knew was okay and was taken for granted, it wouldn't be a matter of shame 
or a matter of you know that the, the people would i mean they'd always, always avoid to a certain extent because you again it's a question of personal denial there's nothing wrong with me it's all about you so it's always going to be hard to get people perhaps to access help but if we had it as something that was always there and everybody used it i think it would become a little bit more acceptable for people to sort of say i've got a broken leg i go to the doctor i've got a broken heart i go for the cancer yeah and it feels that we're we're moving a bit more in that direction but there's always that issue around resource isn't there and i think that you know those yeah that that support is available if you can afford to pay for it or if you've got time <laughs> if you can wait for a very long time you might access it but those who we're talking about today are perhaps in either of those situations and that goes back to my argument with it, it would save money in the long yeah. and it's a great pity that we look at budgets as um discrete so in other words you have a school budget you have an educational budget, you have this budget, you have that budget, instead of seeing actually it's all society. What is happening in society and what is costing money? Mm. When you look at it that way and you start seeing, well, okay, people in prisons, people doing crimes, people doing murders, people doing committing suicide, people getting ill. That budget that, you know, that we, we, we have to expend to, to help people at the end of all of that actually could be um, you know, we'd save a lot if we put that budget in at the beginning and didn't let them get to that situation right at the end. We, we you know, we had them off at the pass, as it were. Yeah. And it would be cheaper. I think that, they, you know, they have worked out. There is the, there's some ideas about if you, if you sort of put money into counselling, how much would you, you know, would you, would you actually save? I think it's something like, you know, for one, every one pound, you save 11 pounds or something. Wow. Well, a billion pounds, you save 11, you know, 11 billion pounds. I mean, it's, 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 it's asinine that we spend, we have to expend that amount of money on, in a sense, on bandaging people instead of preventing them getting the damage in the first place. It can be hard with those sort of prevention strategies, though, to, to get people to invest in them because it's very, you know, you're, you're working on the long term and you're preventing something you're not, you know, you, you don't know who it was going to, you know, it's very hard, isn't it? I remember when I was doing my PhD trying to work out outcome measures for, for, for prevention. Uh, it's very, very, very difficult. But I, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Prevention is always going to be better than cure. It's, it's an attitude of society. I mean, it's things like if you look at, you know, for many, many years, I think the figures are not as bad as they used to be, but looking at teenage pregnancy. And, you know, you looked at, at, at what would prevent young people getting pregnant. And of course, what they ended up realising is, in fact, aspiration is what prevents kids getting pregnant. <laughs> if they have a life to look forward to, they tend not to get pregnant. Um, so if you raise kids as young people's aspirations, that does actually take a cut out of the teenage pregnancy rate. But if you were comparing, let's say, you know, um, the Netherlands to England, and at one particular time, I think it was something like um, eight times the number of, of young people in this country got pregnant than out there. Because what they were doing is having explicit sex education in schools for decades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, you know, and, and teenagers would talk to their parents far more than our teenagers would because the whole area around sex and relationships was so much more sensible, was so much more open, was so much more understood. Now, we're getting there and our teenage pregnancy rate has got a drop. Yes, fantastic. But I'm just thinking about, you know, so many other things um, are also better in the Netherlands. And it is things like mental health and, and teenage suicide and things like that because young people feel they have a voice. They're being respected to be given information about which they, you know, so they can make choices in their lives. That shows a respect, um, which I don't think we have enough of in this country. We still tend to rather have, you know, young people need to be looked after and told what to do. We can't trust them. Um, and I think that trust actually, you know, ends up with better behaviour. What do you think would need to happen for that to change? <laughs> Ah, good question. Um, we need to import the, uh, what's that wonderful lady who's the um, PM in, in New Zealand? Can we have her, please? Uh, yeah. In who, who run countries, you know, in Scandinavia. Um, I think it's, it's, it's about attitudes that we, you know, we still seem to be, be, be having our country run by men who went to public school. Mm. Well, what their attitudes tend to be about sex and relationships, you know, not terribly healthy. Um, I suppose we need to have more women at the top, we have to have more women making decisions about budgets and not feeling that they have to do it the way that men have always done it. Um, more mums, I suppose, more dads who actually are hands-on dads, mm. the ones who separate themselves off from being parents. I, I, I have a phrase which is think like a parent. If there are so many decisions you make in society as a politician, if you thought as a parent, you might actually do something which is different and, and, and kinder, and more respectful 
and more helpful. If you were thinking in terms of, would I want my child to be in this situation? And I mean, you look at, at kids in care, the care system is shocking, absolutely shocking, that you can still have in this day and age, a situation where children are being, sort of as it were, sent from one home to another to another, not because it's actually for their sake, but for, to save money, mm. it's still going on. You have kids who you know, have 13 placements in a year, nothing to do with them or their behavior, but because the, 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 the authority is saving money by sending them to these different places. Would you want your child to go through that? If everybody who was running you know, care, child care organizations or anywhere in this country was thinking in terms of, I want my child to be in that situation, I think you'd have better outcomes. But I think it's also in, in a sense, you know, running banks, running schools, whatever. I think this is why teachers can often be so good because what they're also doing is looking at these, these are my children, yeah. all of them. <laughs> and I do for them what I would do for my own child. But because that's because you're face-to-face you're -face with those kids. If you're in a political situation in an office, you may not be thinking in that way. Yeah, you're many steps removed, aren't you? And you don't think of your own child in that sort of situation. And I think we need to start doing that. We, we need to start running our countries for our children. Yeah. And I, I, I think the, the one thing that, that worries me, though, is you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. My experience of why teachers, school staff are so brilliant with our children is because they treat them like their own and they care so deeply. But I think that's also sometimes their detriment. I mean, right now, I'm really worried about the well-being of staff in our schools because they seem to have had to hold it together for everyone during the course of the pandemic. And how do you, I mean, you must have to do this. You're taking on other people's problems all the time. How do you protect yourself when you're doing that and you care? Debrief, and this is why I have a bit of a, a boring thing about agony people who are not trained. Because part of my training as a Relate counsellor, I, I, I started being an agony aunt before I was actually trained by Relate. Although, as I said, I was trained by the psychosexual counsellor. was so wonderful. So I was already trained in the, in the rec recognition that for a start, it's 50% me and 50% the other person, um, and you have to let go. But when I did my relate training, what was really, really useful was to recognize this ability to stop at the, you know, at the door, as it were. Um, I work from home, but I still have this idea of at the end of the day, I close down and I, and I leave it. And that while I can offer help, while I can offer advice, I suppose, while I can offer information, while I can offer insight, um, in the end, it is that person's decision and it has to be that person's responsibility because I can't be there all the time saying, do this, do that. They have to take responsibility themselves. And so I have to be handing it over. So whether I'm doing face-to-face -face counseling or whether I'm doing um, you know, radio work, uh, telephone work, um, writing work, it is always with the aim of handing it over. And that means that I have to recognize the limits of my help. Terribly frustrating sometimes as an agony aunt. And even as a counsellor, you know this, you, you get to a certain point when you have to say, you know, go off and go on writing your own story. And I don't know the end of the story. It's yeah. getting worse when all you have is one letter and you don't know the end of the story. You don't know whether they took your advice. <clears throat> you don't know if they did something that made it better. You don't know. And you have to live with that and you have to let go. That and sounds I, really hard. Don't you just find yourself wondering? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose this is it. The, 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 the ones that I dealt with in, in, in uh, Step Families, in the, the series, who I kept in touch with afterwards. Um, yes, it was lovely to see the, you know, the development, to see that the end of the story was, was, um, was so good. But yes, you have to get used to that and you have to know to step back. And so you have to debrief yourself. So at the end of the day, you know, I, in a sense, rituals are lovely. So generally at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a bath. And, you know, take my Kindle in the bath and read. And that's the separation between the working day and the evening. And it absolutely separates it. And so I do let go. And that was one of the things that I think is incredibly important, whether I'm, as I said, agony aunt or counsellor or whatever, you draw that line and step away from it and know that you have to let it go. And I really worry about some of the people that I see doing some of this work when you know they haven't had that training. Mm. For a start, they're getting hooked. So you get yourself in a situation where you're with somebody, you're talking with somebody, and it's, it's an issue perhaps that actually speaks to you. And so you're giving advice for yourself, not necessarily advice for that person. Or you're, you know, you're seeing things that in fact are not really there because you're seeing your own story rather than their story. Training helps you not do that. Um, if, you, if you are doing counselling, you know, have, having a supervisor where you can discuss things, where you can do that, having somebody else's eye, helping you untangle what's really going on incredibly important anybody who gives advice who does not have that sort of background 
that sort of support, I think is dangerous in self and, and, and for themselves and dangerous to the people that they're helping. Wow, that's a big, uh, <laughs> but, and, and I think that this is one of the things that many of the people that I work with worry about is, is how much is it safe for them to do? Um, because there aren't enough trained professionals out there for the number of problems that there are. And so many people find themselves stepping into the breach and needing to be that person, but not feeling qualified to do so. Absolutely. And when they get to the point where maybe they've, they've got burnt out, because there's a limit to how often, you know, and how long you can do this. Yeah. Being able to say, I have to step back. I can no longer do this or I need to take a sabbatical. I need to take some time off. Um, that is very hard to do. Uh, and you can, yes, I think you can get pulled in to continuing when you shouldn't. And as I said, it's then affecting you or you're trying to help other people in a way that you actually are actually you're, you're trying to help yourself through them and you need them more perhaps than they need you yeah yeah and i suppose that's a really useful touch point isn't it is am i doing this for me or am i doing it for them yeah honestly who is really being helped here whose cup of coffee is that the lovely sort of thing that we, we have uh, in in training <clears throat> i'm trying to think if it's a relator or is it uh, family lives but it's about whose cup of coffee is this there's <clears throat> a cup of coffee there is that is that my child's cup of coffee and i'm trying to you know deal with it and thinking it's mine or is it actually mine and it's your problems then you need to deal with your problems if it's theirs you have to say this is yours and not mine and as the adult do you think it's ever okay to share your problems with the child that you're trying to support if they feel kind of relevant pertinent familiar i think it's extremely important and i think very advisable to recognize that that you know for them to recognize that you're a person with problems that you're not divorced from all of this that you're not perfect um so to have some insight into what might have happened yes but if you're leaning on them if you're using your child as your therapist um, or your friend um no that is an absolute no no i think i mean i think it's terribly important however much respect to teenagers um letting them take charge of their own decisions and their own feelings and being able to have opinions of their own that's incredibly important. But you are the parent, not the friend. And that's another of my red flags of people who said, oh yes, with my daughter, we go out and we're like sisters and you know, we're deep friends. Oh, uh, uh, uh. She doesn't need a friend, she's got friends. She wants you to be the parent. And occasionally as a parent, you need to make yourself very unpopular by saying no. And you don't say no in the same way to a friend as you do to a child. And you need to hold on to that. When you're adults, perhaps again, it shifts. But when that person is a teenager, Yes, to know that you have fallibilities and problems and have had problems. I dealt with it this way, perhaps. This has happened to me. I can remember that. And, and this is how I dealt with it. Or this is how I did not deal with it well. And I'd hate to see you going through the same problems. That can be quite valuable. But leaning on them, using them to help you, um, or just doing it as a, hey, look at me, I've done the same thing. I mean, that's an awful thing. When the child comes to you with a problem and you instantly leap in, oh, I had the same problem. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear you saying, oh dear, can I, that's tough. You know, what can I do to help you? They don't want to just have you one-upping them with I've got a problem even worse than you. And they don't want you to lean on them. They really don't need that. There's an important role there. Wow, mm -hmm. we've, we've covered a lot. Do you have a, a kind of closing thought you would like to leave people with? Um, be kind. <laughs> I think it's incredibly important. Listen. Um, yes, be open about your emotions and feelings, but don't lean on you know, your children in that sort of way. Um, don't invest them. You know, they're not your, they're not your her therapist to a start. Um, and you're not their therapist. You're their parent and their helper. And sometimes you need to pull in a therapist to help them properly. Um, I think it's just about listening and communicating. And that's really the most important thing. Um, listen and communicate. 